Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, my name is Valerian Sifuashvili. I'm the Director of Academic Programs here at the Alexander Hamilton Society, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our uh, discussion with Daniel Rundi on his new book, uh, The American Imperative, Reclaiming Global Leadership Through Soft Power. Here it is in my, in my hand, and also there's a nice poster behind Dan there as well. And I hope in the hands of um, those of you who were first to register for this talk and receive the complimentary copies in advance. And at the end of this talk, I hope um, for all of you who are joining us for the discussion, um, and you'll be um, inspired and encouraged to uh, purchase it, which I highly recommend it. And I hope all of you are able to find time uh, to read it. Um, tomorrow is the one year anniversary of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, and over the past year, our focus has rightly been on the necessity of hard power. Uh, President Biden's visit earlier this week to Ukraine demonstrated that U.S. leadership and military support remain indispensable in preventing a, a, a dictatorship like Russia from conquering country like Ukraine that aspires to build a democracy. Um, as a Georgian American, sadly, that's no news to me. Russia did that in uh, 2008 uh, in Georgia, occupies 20 percent of the country. And even before that, 100 years ago in 1921, when there was no U.S. or the West to to, to stop it, uh, Russia uh, took over the entire country. Um, but still, as we witnessed firsthand the necessity of hard power, Dan's book is a, is a good reminder that at this pivotal time, when in addition to aggressive Russia, we are also witnessing the rise of China, we need to marshal our strength in all areas, including soft power, um, to help not only Ukraine to prosper and build democracy, but also countries in the developing world that are wanting to have a chance to have a life of, of dignity. Um, Dan's book also makes a persuasive case for why that also benefits our interests here at home, something that, that we'll touch on in our conversation. So I cannot imagine a, a more important topic than that, and we're fortunate to have Dan tell us how to do it, do it as he's uniquely qualified to do so, given his breadth and depth of experience working on U.S. development policy. Um, Dan is currently a senior vice president at, and director of uh, the Project on Prosperity and Development at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, as, um, as it is known here in, in DC. Uh, prior to CSIS, then held senior leadership roles um, at USAID and the World Bank Group. And early in his career, then worked in commercial banking at Citibank in Argentina and investment banking at Alex Brown and Sons. Most important, and I think something that comes across from this book and talking uh, with Dan and learning about his conversations with our students on campuses, is that Dan is, is passionate and committed to building a more democratic and prosperous world through principled and strong US leadership, which I think then I can say makes you a Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, so thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you for, for, for joining us today. I really enjoyed the book. I'm excited to have this conversation with you. I have a lot of, a lot of questions. Um, but uh, I want to, we have students and and uh, and uh, and others in the audience, so I want to leave time for them as well to to join us and and engage with you directly. So we'll leave some time for that. And for those of you in the attendance, you can use the Q and A function uh, to submit questions. Um, and and you know you don't need to wait until we got to the Q and A. You can submit them, and I'll I'll make sure to have them uh, in uh, you know piled up in my 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 uh, questions. And then us, I'll unmute you, and you can ask Dan the question. Uh, directly. So I won't be reading your questions. I'll give you an opportunity to engage directly, and I'll keep decent amount of time uh, time for that. But thank you, Dan, again, for joining us. Thank you for visiting our chapters on university camp campuses. And I think the way, you know, way I would like to start this conversation is the way you do, which is with history um, and history of development policy. You kind of give a wonderful uh, um, historical overview of the 1950s and how the ideas, events that shaped it. So um, if you can briefly give us that a little bit of, of the ideas and events, Marshall Plan, um, USAID establishment, maybe a little bit on NED, and, and then we'll go from there. So, but thank Great. you. I'm so appreciative, Valerian. Thank you. I, I am such a fan of the Alexander Hamilton Society. You all have been such a generous uh, host. Your, your chapters are amazing. The students are really impressive. I've now spoken at three. They're all sharp. They give me hope for the future. That's great. I'm really so grateful to you and the team in Washington, but I'm also really appreciative uh, of the reception I've gotten. Uh, I've now spoken at three of your chapters uh, about the book. And so I really appreciate this opportunity to speak, for, do this virtual event. Thank you so much. Thank so you. So <clears throat> I wrote this book because, and I'll, I'll come to this question of history in yeah, a second. Sure. I think that um, 
great power competition has come. If we, if you believe in the concept of great power competition, mm-hmm. great power competition, not going to happen in Beijing and it's not going to happen in Moscow. It's going to happen largely in the developing world. Mm-hmm. So some of that's going to be military. I'm for a 500 ship Navy. I'm for um, making sure that Ukraine has every weapon it needs. And I want, and I've, I have a lot to talk, say about Ukraine. I'm running a big Ukraine reconstruction. That's right. Yeah. Mission. But most of this competition is going to be in non the non-military sphere. It's going to be vaccines or digital or mining or energy or trade or infrastructure. It's going to be about values, things like democracy and human rights. It's going to be about like how we talk, how who, who we communicate and how we speak to people and whether we're speaking to people's greatest hopes and aspirations or not. So my view is, is that if you believe we're in a period of great power competition, and you believe that most of this great power competition is going to happen in, in not in the military sphere, then we're going to need a strategy for the next 20 to 30 years that is, that, and, and we've done this in the past, and that's how you think what, what I think comes back to why, why I want to talk about that. Sure, sure. But that's the, th- that's why I wrote this book. And so um, we, Right at the end of World War II, from 19, so we did have the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, which set up the International Monetary Fund, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which later became the WTO, and we set up the International, uh, the World Bank, uh, which was to set up was to do in re- reconstruction, finance the reconstruction of Europe primarily. So, what happened was. There was a series of, there's a very good book. Ben Steele did a book called Marshall Plan, Dawn of the Cold War, mm-hmm. which is a phenomenal, but he's wrote a book about the history of the Bretton Woods Conference called Battle Bretton Woods. And then wrote another book called uh, Marshall Plan, Dawn of the Cold War, really fabulous books. And mm-hmm. uh, he's a great, great uh, speaker. And the there was a realization in 1948, the Soviet Union engineered a coup in Czechoslovakia. And this was an enormous shock because there had been these agreements with the Soviet Union. They were going to kind of respect sort of the lines at the end of the coal, at the end of the World War II. Well, that wasn't the case at all, that they were starting to kind of make moves. And the other thing that happened was is there was a realization that there was something like <clears throat> um, there was um, many that many countries could go communist. So Mm -hmm. there was this great fear of communism, that there was the emergence of the Cold War, which led to the establishment of the Marshall Plan in 1948. So it didn't happen in 1944. It didn't happen at the end of the war in 1945. It happened as a result of fear of the Soviet Union and actions that the Soviet Union took. To get the Marshall Plan done, they linked the Marshall Plan with NATO. So development was linked to security. Mm -hmm. And so it was always, from the beginning, it's always been sort of linked to our national interest and sort of core Mm -hmm. foreign policy, national security objectives. So um, there is actually a story in Dawn of the Cold War, uh, Marshall Plan, Dawn of the Cold War, that there were something like 200 members of Congress visited Europe on different delegations. Richard Nixon was a freshman member of Congress and went to Italy all the members of Congress were forbidden to bring like a tuxedo for like evening wear because they didn't want anyone to think it was a junket. Mm-hmm. But this was like, and so it was because they were afraid and there was ma- a mass education campaign of members of Congress and a major shift in our mind sh- sh- set saying, this is a new age and we're going to need to strengthen Europe, not because we feel we care about Europe, we do care about Europe, but because we need strong allies, we need strong partners and allies to, and we wanna make sure that countries don't fall under the communist, under communism. And so that is what was the, re, that was what started the Marshall Plan. Then, and, and we you and I have talked about this private, separately, um, you know, you kind of fast forward 10 years and what was realized was, okay, there was a lot of attention in Europe But the Soviet Union was making moves in Southeast Asia. By this time, China had fallen and uh, you had uh, movements in Latin America and and as independence started to percolate in Africa, Mm 
some of that there was a temptation among some countries to think about thinking about communism. So the world, we looked through the lens to a Cold War lens. And there was a book that encapsulated this challenge called The Ugly American, which was, which was published in 1958. And I don't think there's been a book as influential in foreign policy since the book, The Ugly American. And people have heard the term. They know they're not sure, you know, most people use the term in the wrong way because the ugly American in the book is a hero, as you know, Valerian. And those of you in, who were in, your, in the AHS reading group a couple of years ago about the ugly American would know this. Right. Mm -hmm. And John F. Kennedy was so transfixed by this book because what happened was the book basically laid bare our shortcomings in terms of how we engaged with people and that we weren't speaking to developing country. We weren't speaking their language. We weren't sending people out into villages. We weren't in, in helping them solve their most basic problems. Whereas he, the book implied that the communists were. John Kennedy was so shocked. He bought a hundred copies and sent one to every member of the US Senate. He was so, he, he there. It is believed that the book had such an impact on him that as soon as he was elected, he did several things as a result of that book. He established the Peace Corps. He established the Foreign Assistance Act in 1961, which is sort of the basic organizing act that we currently use still today for AID and a lot of our soft power work. He right. set up the Green Berets. He re reorganized the U.S. Information Agency, USIA. Um, there was some uh, one other historical point that I just want to mention. Sure, sure. Um, Richard Nixon visited Venezuela, I think it was in 1959. And he was almost killed in Venezuela in 1959. Like the security, like they like the, the protesters got a hold of the car and they broke the windshield. They had to like, I think, shoot the gun to get people to mm -hmm. get away. So he almost was killed in Venezuela by protests. This had an enormous, this was a huge deal in 1959. As a result, the Eisenhower administration said, we got to do something about Latin America. And they said, we're going to establish the Inter-American Development Bank. Mm -hmm. The first regional development bank, which had been an idea kicking around since the late 19th century, since the 1880s, was only established in 1959 because of this disastrous tour that Nixon took in 59. Kennedy saw this tour was aware of this, saw the establishment of the Inter-American Development Bank, and said, we're going to establish a new initiative for the Americas called the Alliance for Progress. Again, a direct result of Cold War calculus, specific geostrategic issues that had, that had happened at the time. And so as a result of that, that that's what happened. Thank then, you. so let's fast forward to Ronald Reagan. So Ronald Reagan, we're at another period of Cold War tension. Ronald Reagan calls the Soviet Union the evil empire uh, in partnership with, with uh, Margaret Thatcher and, the, and Pope John Paul II. Um, says, we're going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to go on a fence on this, in this war. And we're going to, we're going to speak for our values. We're going to stand up for democracy. We're going to stand up for human rights. So he gives a speech in 1982 uh, at Westminster in the United Kingdom saying, we're going to stand up for democracy and we're going to establish in the United States. The Germans have this really interesting system of institutes called Stiftungs. And many of your listeners will know what I'm talking about that represent different political parties in Germany to kind of support democracy promotion and civil society in other parts of the world, including, and they were very important in Spain and Portugal. Uh, in the 1970s, the Stiftung Institutes were very important to kind of bring, helping support democracy the, in Portugal and Spain in the 1970s. So Reagan said, we're going to set up a series of institutes, a private sector institute, a labor institute, one for the Republican Party, one for the Democratic Party. And we're going to create an overall organization called the National Endowment for Democracy. And we're going to make a, a, a bipartisan in perpetuity commitment to have our finger on the scale of democracy, better governance, and human rights. And so Reagan spoke to that at the time. And people in prisons in the Soviet Union heard the Westminster speech, people like uh, Natan Sharansky, and said, This this person's speaking to us. Right. So yeah. it was so, you know, th this is not a Republican thing. This isn't a Democratic thing that we need to have 
and then there was, if you go fast forward to the fall, the Berlin Wall, uh, George H.W. Bush, George Bush 41, and then Clinton to, undertook a number of steps to try and help support um, the reincorporation of, of, the, of countries that have been in, behind the Iron Curtain into kind of modernity, into the West. So the Czech Republic, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, Romania, the Caucasus, countries like Georgia, uh, even, you know, so many countries had some major success like Poland. Look at Poland today. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a, a member of NATO, member of the European Union, uh, fair, made enormous progress towards kind of converging with, with European Union states. It's a, it's a powerhouse. And and then you've got countries that haven't had as much success, but but you have to say that there's been you know there was a lot of efforts made to help support those countries and with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Yeah. So at, at kind of key geostrategic moments, we've looked to non-military forms of our power to respond to challenges, and I would argue that this age of great power competition is one of those moments, and that we need to go back to the drawing board, revisit our instruments and think about what we need to do for this new age. Great, great. Thank you, Dan, for that, that wonderful historical perspective and overview. And there's, there's a lot more in your book, and I hope uh, our students and, and, and those in the audience um, uh, get to learn more about that. But as you point out, there are two things that kind of come out of that. There's that geopolitical necessity, but also the recognition of our leaders that we do not need to focus on the needs of the, the people we are helping. And there's something that enlightened self-interest that you're, you're talking about. So. Um, we can can unpack that a little bit later, and I want to do that when we talk about kind of uh, liberal democracy and, and the value of that and how they can achieve life of dignity for people. But first, let's address the big kind of geopolitical threat, China, which you for you is the kind of the big, gives us the sense of um, urgency now, and that it's the primary geopolitical um, uh, necessity that needs to be addressed. So a kind of a threefold question, and, and you can kind of decide what you want to address more. For, you know, one of the things that you say in the book is that it's kind of hard not to appreciate the magnitude of China's achievement and the rise, right? So what, how did China achieve this? That's one. Um, second is what are, what are the intentions and motivations behind China now? What are they trying to do? What, what aims are they trying to advance? Um, and, and how, and then kind of, how can we push that back. Uh, um, so we can start with the, how did China achieve what it did and what are the, you know, what are the motivations and then how are they advancing them? And then we can get to kind of what we can do later actually. So I have a chapter, several chapters in the book about China mm -hmm. and because it's, I think it's very important we understand. I'm not a China expert. So oftentimes when people say like, why are you talking about China, Dan? You're not a Sinologist and you don't speak Mandarin. That's true. but I do think that if we want to understand, um, I, I, I do know enough to know that I needed to get educated a little bit on, on sort of the China as a country and, it's, and sort of its progress. If you look at the progress of China in the last 40 years, it's been one of the most stunning achievements in human history. You have to give that to them. They've pulled something like 400 million people out of poverty. They've become the second largest economy in the world. They're now the largest trading partner. In, in the year 2000, they were, um, the United States had about 120 countries. We were the largest trading partner for, partner for about 120 countries. Today, China is the largest trading partner for about 130 countries, out of say about 200 countries. So that is flipped. And so, you know, the, you have to ask, like, how did that happen? And well, I think part of it is, they made a whole bunch of mistakes. They had this great leap forward and the, uh, all these crazy things that they did, the cultural revolution, they were disasters for China. Uh, their one child policy, I think they're just beginning now to kind of reap the, 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 the terrible harvest of their one child policy. But um, they had a series of really bad decades where it almost, they had to kind of get beaten out of them, the crazy, some of the crazier ideas they had in their system. Mm -hmm. And mil unfortunately, millions of people died and hundreds of millions of people's lives were terribly disrupted or ruined. <clears throat> and so I think only then were they able to say, well, we're gonna try something different. So they started making an opening to the West. 
partially because of fear of the Soviet Union. They'd had border disputes with the Soviet Union, both geo, you know, from a foreign policy standpoint. And then later they said, well, we're going to open up uh, certain parts of the country to foreign direct investment because we're interested in getting technology transfers. And so all of their agreements had big technology transfer commitments, but they were also really, they had kind of had these bad experiences. They said, well, we're going to, we're going to take a clipboard and we're going to like go and listen to how other people did it. And we're going to ask for help. So for example, in 1983, they went to Australia and said, you know, we are interested in developing our scientific capacities. We'd like to work with you on Antarctica. Could you partner with us on Antarctica? That was 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. So for the first 25 years or so, they partnered with the Australians on science and learned how to do, how do you set up a base camp? Why do you need an all weather airstrip? Why do you need to build icebreakers? How do you build an icebreaker? Tell me about that. And so they listened. And then they said, okay, you know, United States, you've got this thing in the 1960s and 1970s about bringing excellent people from the developing world to study in the United States. That is a really interesting idea. We have a number of fine universities in China. We'll start setting up programs, some of which is going to be in English. And, you know, we're cheaper than, say, Harvard or Tulane. So we'll, you know, we'll do it. At, we'll, we'll sell Chevrolets instead of Cadillacs in the university space. And, but it'll be a way for us to start having people have Beijing on the speed, speed dial as opposed to Boston on yeah. the speed dial. So they, 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 um, they, had a, they were really hard. Uh, they worked really hard. They opened themselves up partially to free market to, to sort of some, some parts of their economy were kind of liberated, if I can put it that way, mm-hmm. and had really positive outcomes for them. Then what's happened, though, is when the moments had to pick between, well, do I want to have state control or am I, am I afraid of losing control or not? They always pick for I want to have control. Mm-hmm. So they, they need growth at any cost and they need order at any cost, right? They need control at any cost. And so they've got these two challenges, but they, um, they clearly have a vision for what kind of world they want. They want to be at the center of the world. They would like to rewrite the world, the or the or the lib, the or the, I'm going to use a bunch of fancy words, liberal international order. The, the, the everyone on this call will know what that is. But this is, you know, the the rules of the game that were set up after World War II. They don't like the current rule set. They'd like to have a much bigger seat at the table. Um, my view, and you know, I think there was an assumption for 40 years in Washington across Republican and Democratic administrations that we should engage them in what the concept was called a um, uh, stakeholder, responsible stakeholder. Yeah, Delic's idea, yeah, Robert. Bob Delic's idea, and he's great, and he was right, and and every he it reflected what many many people thought yeah. at mm-hmm. the time, and that that was a reasonable assumption, and so. I, I, you know, at the time, I'd have said that makes total sense. I still think, I think there's been a little bit of an overshooting in Washington to say that that totally didn't work. I think it largely hasn't worked. I would argue that the jury isn't fully out on whether it's worked. What do I mean by that? I, I don't have the precise numbers, but I believe there's only a hand of the 26 people. There's like 26 people on the, the Politburo in China. I think one or two have studied abroad. I believe 15 years from now or 10 years from now, 10 will have studied abroad because something like several million of China's elites have studied abroad in the last 20 years. So they're just now starting to kind of rise to kind of like levels of responsibility. And it'll be probably another 10 or so, 15 years before they rise to kind of jobs in the Politburo. So we don't know it to some extent. I mean, maybe I'm being a little, maybe I'm being too naive and that maybe that's the kind of thing someone in a think tank says, like we don't know. But I would just argue that maybe we there's still that some of the some of our investments in China engaging people haven't fully kind of come to fruition. I could you could argue. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know Aaron uh, Friedberg, who is co-founder of AHS, makes a good point about this. I think it was not it was a good idea to try and give engagement a chance, but let's have a plan in case that doesn't work out, right? So that then, the, the, so that we can respond 
um, um, and adjust as things change. So let's switch to now, as, as you say, you know, the competition will not play out in Moscow or Beijing. I think that's an important point. So let, let's switch to the, the developing world and the place where you say this, this competition is going to play out and take place first. So why, why do you say that? Why do you think that's important for our, our, our audience, audience to take away, to not think about Beijing and Moscow and instead, um, you know, countries in Central Asia and Latin America and Africa? Uh, what's the kind of the argument that, that you want to make and, and take away for them to have? Right. So what I would say is that there are, it, we don't want a world ultimately that's run by China and Russia. Mm -hmm. And so if you add up the sum total of all the different little pieces of how the world is works, mm -hmm. who runs the World Bank, where do elite people go to school, where do people get their, where do people get their information from, where do people, uh, how, what, di who controls the digital rails in developing countries like the digital connectivity, mm -hmm. where do you get your vaccines from, who do you trade with, uh, where do you, um, you know, who builds your roads and airports, um, who you vote with at the United Nations, uh, what kind of willingness are you to kind of burden share on big problems in the world? These are the kind of, these are the kind of pieces of kind of the global rules of the road. Who sets the standards for internet technology? Who sets the standards for phyto, you know, different kinds of various, you know, important things. These are kind of components of a world that America made with its partners in, at the end of World War II, based largely. I mean, there were pieces of it beforehand, but it was kind of like we hit the reset button at the end of World War II, and this has kind of been version 2.0 and version, you know, some, basically it's been kind of evolved since then. The Russians and the Chinese would like to dismantle that, and they would like to set up a world that is going to be a lot less friendly to democracy, a lot more friendly to corruption. If you're concerned about religious freedom, you're not gonna like the world they're running. If you're concerned about people getting in your business of your most personal intimate decisions, like how many children you're gonna have, you're not gonna like this world. Uh, if you are concerned about freedom of association and the freedom of the press and freedom of speech, you're not gonna like this world. If you're gonna like, if you don't, if, you, if you'd like to have you know, the ability to start a business or you know, pick, pick where you wanna live or where you go to school, you know, you're not going to like this world. If you want to, if you, you know, if you, if you believe in a system or want to work towards a system that largely is more or less fair with some problems and unfairnesses and weaknesses, and more or less um, gives people somewhat of a fair shake if they, if they play by the rules and do certain things, and doesn't operate on kind of a fully, cor fully corrupt system, you're not going to like this world because all those things, corruption, one-child policy, religious repression, cyber surveillance state, uh, lack of free speech, weak or no rule of law, that's, what, that's the system they're going to set up is going to have those values embedded in it. We're not going to like it. Your kids aren't going to like it. I'm not going to like it. Our grandchildren aren't going to like it. So we don't want them setting up an alternative system. So a lot of the ways in which they fiddle with that system is in the non-military space. So some of it's a diplomacy thing and a lot of it isn't kind of like development or development-like activities. Mm -hmm. So um, let me just use the Trump administration. The Trump administration was not particularly, would you, you know, what might what, what, what be described as sort of internationalist skeptic administration, right? Sure, yeah. Let me just give you some examples. They came in saying they were going to get rid of something called the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. That within six months, they turned around and said, no, we're going to put it on steroids. Why? Because they had gotten access to information about how big of a threat China was, mm -hmm. and they said, we're going to take this seriously. They came in saying, we're going to get rid of the U.S. Export-Import Bank. They went in, they saw the challenge of China, and they were saying that China was kicking our butt all over the world. And they said, no, we're going we're gonna to fix the U.S. Export-Import Bank. And they went ahead and did that. They said, OK, so you know, I think we have, I'm a Republican, and, and I think some Republicans have, we have kind of three reactions to the multilateral system. One is that they're going to take our guns away, or they're going to be mean to Israel, kind of like that's one complaint. Mm 
-hmm. There's another complaint which is like, well, I don't want to get a permission slip from the French to get my national security to protect myself. So sovereignty concerns. Then there's a there's like there's just a bunch of useless people in New York who don't pay their parking tickets. So it's either one of those three reactions is often kind of or all at the same time for many Republicans, that's sort of the kind of the instinct about the multilateral system. Mm -hmm. Well, the Trump administration said we're going to back a candidate from the Republic of Georgia for something called the FAO. Well, there's like 200 of these multilateral organizations. Eh, they basically are the standard setters to say like what's a banana and what's not a banana. They have like a book of phytosanitary standards. They're a standard maker. Well, why is that important? Well, if you're trading in bananas, they'll say, well, what's a banana? Well, the FAO says it's a banana, so it must be a banana, so you can trade it, right? So it's an important standard setting body among other things. Okay, wow. China put forward a candidate. They got 120 votes and the Georgian candidate backed by the United States got 12. This was during the Trump administration. We got our butts kicked. The be one of the best articles I've read on international affairs was in foreign policy talking about this election, probably in like 2017 or 2018. And it's worth a long read in foreign policy. I forget who wrote it, but it was about the FAO election. Okay. It was such an embarrassing and chastening experience for the Trump administration that they said, we can't have our, we can't afford to have some of these important institutions this isn't 1995 anymore. And we can't afford to have these important institutions run, some of them run by China. If they wanna run the International Tiddlywinks Association or the International Chess Association, that's fine, but we don't want them running the IMF. We don't want them being the Secretary General of NATO. There's something like 30 of these, what you might describe as like the commanding heights of the multilateral system. Yeah. These are institutions that have money, they have access to really sensitive information. They set rules. Um, they're standard makers. We want, the West should be standard makers, not standard takers. Right. When right. China comes into these institutions, they immediately kick Taiwan out. They oftentimes say, well, we're gonna hire a whole bunch of people who are Chinese Communist Party members into the system as junior people. And then they say, well, we're gonna hire really fine firm like PLA.com <laughs> computer company you know, to run the cloud or this sort of a thing, right? So you've got to watch the store a little bit on some of these important institutions. Like I said, like, if yeah. they want to run some more marginal ones, that's fine. But what's happened is they are now putting forward really excellent candidates. And so we should care about the international system and we should care about the developing world because these are where this is, where a lot of this is playing out. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, and the only thing I would add to that, which is you make it clear in your in your book as well, a lot of the, the people in this international multilateral organizations and officials from developing countries, they want to work with the US, they don't prefer to have, you know, uh, to work with Chinese officials. So it's really in our hands to to maintain and, and continue to, to nurture uh, that, uh, that influence. So um, it's not only what China is doing, but if we don't do things well. That's that's only only thing that's going to uh, uh, affect the change. So I have a, a few more questions, but let's uh, as a reminder for the audience, um, just put your questions in the Q and A function, and then I'll call on you um, um, and and have you ask the question uh, uh, directly uh, to to Dan. But so one one question, and which is then you touched on it a little bit, but I think at the core and the heart of this um, this book. Um, and is, is your belief still in the kind of the value of liberal democracy that, you know, kind of that is the foundation for moral, social, economic progress? You wrote about how, you, you know, mentioned you completely bought into uh, the Bush agenda and the kind of promotion of that uh, uh, and then how that's better for, you know, governance and, and prosperity. So if you can maybe tell us a little bit about why you still continue to believe that, not still, well, I, I share your beliefs, so not still, I'm not questioning it, but tell us why, why do you think that still holds true? Why that's something that, that all countries and cultures can benefit from? And I would add that, why do you think there is some kind of skepticism of that um, in this generation, both left and right in some ways? Um, and... Um, because if we are going to kind of engage in this competition the way you would like and the way I would like, and, and I think in order for us to succeed, it cannot be just about denying China the leadership role. It has to be also protecting and preserving something that we value and love. 
Uh, and that's going to be the, something that's inspirational, I think, in your own example, too. When I was reading this, that comes across, that you were inspired by to do something good and hold something valuable uh, instead of just denying, you know, Soviet Union. So tell, tell us a little bit, because I think you could, uh, you would have something valuable to kind of offer to our uh, audience sure. on that. Well, thanks. So look, I think um, we've got lots of challenges in the United States. And so oftentimes, uh, you know, it's we, people can be easily discouraged, but we are very fortunate to live in a democracy. And so I know that sounds stupid and kind of almost blatantly obvious, but, you know, something like there's 200 countries in the world of which 97 today are democracies. 52% of the world's population lives in a democracy. In 1980, there were 40 democracies and 34% of the world lived in democracy. So there's been over the last 40 years with a lot of toiling in the vineyards, you know, a significant increase in the number of countries that are democracies and the number of people covered by democracies. Democracies um, are hard, they're messy, sure. um, they're not perfect. Uh, it took us a long time. It took us like 150 years plus to get it right until there was kind of full enfranchisement in this country. So um, at least, so I would just say that, um, but at the same time, a lot of global progress on let's call it human rights, better governance, including the anti-corruption agenda and democracy has required American leadership. We haven't been able to do it alone. But any progress in the last 45 years on corruption, starting with something called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, is a result and that we started kind of pushing in this direction, holding American companies around the world to a, a US standard on corruption about bribes. In many countries up until about 15 years ago, even in Europe, you could write off a, as a tax write off a bribe in a third world, in a developing country. If you look at <clears throat> democracies in terms of it's easier, you know, it, it's what there are, there's a book called The Democracy Advantage that talks about countries that are more pro, over time are more prosperous, uh, are have invest more in their people if you have a democracy. Now, there's lots of counterfactuals. People talk about what about the progress in China? What about Pinochet's Chile? Well, there seems to be some point at which when you have enough of a middle class, there, there's some countries that are poor that are demo functioning democracies, you know, like India is an example of this, but mm -hmm. also uh, places like, um, you, you could say there have there been an, an increasing number of African democracies as well, very successful multi-party democracies. Ghana is an example of this. Sure. So if people can choose, they'd much rather choose to live in a democracy than live under some sort of authoritarian regime. Um, and I think that um, we need to speak up for those values because China and Russia um, don't believe in that. They don't believe in those values. And so I was saying earlier that China and Russia can, we, we, they can fill vacuums that we leave behind. And so we need to be able to stick up and stand up for democratic principles. So people like John McCain was a big proponent of human rights, was a big proponent of democracy. And he was an important voice in the Republican Party on these issues. George W. Bush, his second inaugural, which really spoke to me, spoke to my heart. I was in the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. His whole second inaugural is about freedom. And he talked about the freedom agenda. So this is a part, Ronald Reagan was in favor of this. W was in favor of this. HW was supportive as well. Uh, John McCain has been great on this. So I just think um, this is part of uh, an inter internationalist tradition. But ultimately, democracies, more democracies are good for us. We're safe. We, the United States, are safer when there's more democracies. Mm -hmm. We're more likely to have, they're more likely to invest in their people, treat all their people better. Uh, and over time, these societies are, are more just and better places. And, um, and also, to the extent that you have a democracy where everyone feels invested, they're, more or less li they're less likely to migrate. They'd rather, they'd rather stay where they are. So if you cared about, you know, so there's, it's in our interest over time from a prosperity standpoint, from a security standpoint, 
um, from a partnership standpoint to have more democracies in the world, not less. It's in our interest to have uh, a world where people are able to practice their religions freely. People can have freedom of assembly and freedom of speech and pe the media people aren't accosted or murdered or attacked. These are all good things for the West. These are good for us. Look at, look at what happens in a place like Russia. If you're a journalist, you get killed. Yeah, if you're a journalist in China, that's a, that's a risky business. So in, in the long run, we need to stand up for these things. It's not something that's kind of, it's taken a little bit, I'd say in the last 15 years, supporting democracy and human rights has taken a backseat for a bunch of reasons. One is something called the democracy recession. There was a, several waves of democratic improvements, but there's really been kind of like kind of a, a, a lot of slippage in the last 15 years. So at one point it was probably higher than the numbers I cited. So that's disappointing. I also think some people equate democracy, supporting democracies with some of the stuff that happened in Iraq. Sure, sure, so they yeah. say, well, it's not so good or, or, or some, you know, I also think, um, you know, I think some folks on the left have taken the, you know, ha I think, I think there's some folks on the right who think like the democracy, human rights, a good governance agenda feel has a little bit of a of kind of a feel of, of a project of the left. Mm -hmm. It's not totally accurate. Mm -hmm. And so I think Republicans should be comfortable talking about democracy, human rights and governance and we should then speak to what we mean by that and stand up for those things. Great, great. No, thank you, Dan. And I, I think that those are all, all great points. And I think uh, as we are engaged in this competition, it's, I think, critical to, yes, point out the threat of China and the danger that that poses to, to us and why you know, we want to fight against that. But I think it has to come from, from kind of the, what we value. And what, it, what is it that we are trying to, to preserve? Not that we're just trying to keep China down. We're trying to keep uh, you know, uh, dignity and liberal democracy and economic progress and moral flourishing uh, alive through US leadership. And I think that's the, some of the people that you pointed out, leaders like McCain and Kennedy and, and Reagan, those were the ones who kind of, I think, inspired the younger generation and connected with that positive value. Um, and sadly, I mean, I think today we just see people who just kind of Hate, hate, you know, hate China. And I, I think that's just not- Not enough. Good. It's not, not enough. enough. We can't, enough. my message is we can't fight something with nothing. Yeah, yeah. We can't just right. say we hate on the Chai comms, right? No. So no. that, it feels good on the weekends, but it's <laughs> not enough. It's not a strategy. We have to speak yeah. to the hopes and aspirations of people or they'll take their business to China. They'll take their business to Russia. So we have to speak, you know, I, I, was totally inspired by John McCain. I took my oldest son to his funeral. I was so uh, moved by him. I, uh, he was someone I really admired. And uh, he wasn't perfect, uh, but I was, you know, there were just, he was just a very special, yep. very special leader. So, you know, we can't just say, we don't like the Chinese and we don't like the Russians. We've got it. My, the reason I wrote this book is to say, uh, I'm for a military strategy, but I believe that most of this competition isn't going to happen in the military sphere, and we can't fight something with nothing. And nothing also includes values. And so if we say, well, you know, so I do think we're going to have some hard choices. Mm -hmm. that we, we may be returning to something like a second Cold War. And unfortunately, in the, in the Cold War, we often backed bad people who were with us. And so I fear we're going to have those kind of hard choices. We're going to see increasing network sort of, it may be that sort of the, we'll look back on the po post-1989 to kind of 22 to the 2009, that 20 period is kind of a golden age for democracy, human rights, and governance. Sure. But we can't keep pushing. We have to speak for people. We, mm -hmm. I, I believe, and I say this in the book, and maybe this sounds crazy, but I don't think it's crazy. We should work towards a multi-party democracy in Russia that's at peace with its neighbors. We should work towards and hope for a multi-party democracy in China that is at peace with its neighbors and yeah. treats everybody in its society more or less the same. My, my point is we should work towards that. That, that is probably a 50-year project, but it's not, it's not a five-year project, but no one can say that's crazy. No one can say that's impossible. And I, I have lots of people in town tell me it's impossible, and I don't believe that. 
I think that should be the only aim. And I think that's the only way that we could have uh, the next generation feel inspired to, um, to do that. All right, so we have some um, more questions, uh, some questions from the audience then, so I'll go to them. So I have something on education first and then on Latin America. So let's go to Jackson first. And Jackson, go ahead and ask, um, ask your question. Hi, thank you so much for joining us today to hear from you. Um, my, my question regards your statements about education. I know that you stress the importance of education, uh, bringing international students to the U.S. from developing countries and then sending them back to their home countries to then help develop a new generation that's built around Western values. Um, so I guess my question for you is two-part. Um, first, how can we attract more international students, giving more global competition for education? And two, how can we help Chinese students in America get the most out of their education experience and make it more transformative for them? That's, those are great questions. And thanks for that. Um, so I would just say that I think we need to, we should, you know, we use about some federal monies to invest in bringing people here to the United States. I think we ought to be more intentional and we ought to use some of our, we don't necessarily have to spend a lot more money to do this. We might reallocate some of the monies that we spend on foreign assistance and things like global health or on uh, environmental issues to bring people to the United States to work on global health issues, to work on environment issues, so that they go back to their home countries to go work on that and take make that as a 30-year investment on those topics. So I think we need to be more intentional about applying some federal dollars. It's a different educational landscape than 60 years ago. We did a, book, uh, a report about two years ago called Great Power Competition in Education. I don't know, uh, I'll see if I can find it and I'll put it in the chat. But um, but I we we did some. Um, let me just I'll just pull that up while we're talking. Sure. Um, so so I think that um, this is a um, so I think this is a really important issue. It doesn't get enough attention because this is seen as a. Uh, I don't know, it's chat, I think, and let's see if this this works in the chat. I don't know if it, um, if it maybe it is a direct message. Hosts and- I can, uh, I can share with everyone um, quickly. Okay, so, so I think this is an important report on this topic, but I would just say that we should be making some targeted investments. We, look, I think it's sometimes, frankly, unfortunate. Sometimes when leaders in the United States uh, make statements that make people feel unwelcome. I think that's an issue. And I think that, um, I do think that we, um, at the same time, so let me shift to the issue of China. So China has several hundred thousand, before COVID, VC, before COVID, there were hundreds of thousands of students from China studying in the United States every year. Um, my view was, I'm very, I think we should absolutely welcome many Chinese students to come to the United States. I actually think we should be intentional about trying to get some Russian students to come to the United States, frankly. That may be a little bit more tricky and controversial right now. But uh, ultimately, um, I'm not comfortable with surveillance of Chinese students by other Chinese students or Chinese authorities while they're here. I'm not comfortable with uh, Chinese students uh, carrying out what might be described as soft intel operations or hard intel operations. So we need to kind of crack down on that stuff. Um, so to the extent they're playing by the rules and they're not stealing intellectual property or to the extent they're not mistreating other Chinese students or narking on them, as the young people say, back to their home country, then I think we should try and have as many people as possible. I believe that most of them will have to be profoundly impacted. We're an imperfect society with lots of problems, but I think it's a mind, an eye-opening experience for foreign students to come to the United States. If they cannot come here, I'm okay if they go to another country in the West, Japan, Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom, uh, France, Spain, Western Europe, South Korea, New Zealand, if they're going to an o Israel, if they're going to an OECD country, 
I think that if they're from Chinese student, they're going to OEC country, that is a good thing. I think if you're an African student, I'd much rather they come to the United States or an OEC country than go to China. So I do think that this stuff really does matter because what happens is if these, country, these folks go on to become prime minister or central bank president or CEO of a company, their first phone call is to Beijing as opposed to Boston, as I said earlier. So I do think it matters. So I think we should try to find ways with, while balancing some of these concerns to make sure that we remain somewhat open to the extent that we can. I think it would be a, a failure if we had zero students from China in the United States. Great, all right, thanks Dan. All right, let me go to the next question. And we have Carolina, and yeah, I forgot to ask to Jackson, but Carolina, yeah, introduce yourself and um, um, uh, if you are an AHS student, tell us and, and then go ahead and ask, ask your question. Sure thing. Um, is my audio working? Yes, can hear you well. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much for this talk. Um, yes, I am a junior. I've been in AHS for three years now. Um, and I'm studying international relations and political science at Ashland University. Great. And I hope to um, work for the State Department in the future, but that's off in the future, so who knows? Um, yeah, so Valerian, would you like me to uh, share Yes, questions? ask your question, yes. Yes, so the question is about how you recommend the US counter increasing Chinese influence in Latin America through soft power. And um, if I could add, how would the US also respond to their historical legacy of intervention in Latin America as it does this, um, particularly in regards to the Cold War? Thank you. Yeah, okay, thanks. That's a really important and good question. We did a paper. Um, so one of the things that's interesting, uh, I managed our Americas program for the last two and a half years. I stopped doing it about um, about three months ago. Um, and, um, but I hired the person who's running our Americas program. And one of the things I was struck by, my, my wife is from Argentina and I, uh, I lived in Argentina for three years. So, and I lived in Spain for a year. So I, I'm, I'm pretty fluent in Spanish and I have a pretty strong pull of gravity to the Western hemisphere. One of the things I've been struck by is how, how positively well-remembered the Alliance for Progress is in the region. And nine, I think it was 1961 was the Alliance for Progress. And so it was whatever it was, 60 years ago in 2021. So mm -hmm. this was an important uh, moment where the United States said, we're going to co-build together with you in the region a, a more prosperous and, and more free future. Now, if you look at the region, it's a lot more democratic than 60 years ago. Most of the, the 33 or 34 countries are democracies that Nicaragua is not, Venezuela, Venezuela is not, Cuba certainly is not. And then you've got a number of countries with some, some troubles that I won't list here. Um, so it's a more democratic place. The levels of development are so much more higher. The levels of, of literacy, <clears throat> the levels of economic progress are much higher in many countries. Some countries have not gone very, a handful have not progressed as much as they should for a bunch of reasons, largely having to do with governance issues. Um, so I do think we need to have a, a couple of things. I would say that we, um, you know, for the most part have gotten out of the, let me call it the intervention business. So. Most Americans don't remember the last, you know, the the the, the activity, you know, our last, you know, it, it was probably Haiti in 1994 and uh, Panama in 1989. I was in Panama about six months ago. They still remember that they've got a national holiday. So they, you know, there's a saying that the United States never remembers and Latin America never forgets. So it's a touchy thing in the region. I would say that I think Joe Biden is probably um, kind of the most in, most prepared person to look at issues in Latin America we've ever had. Now I'm saying this as a Republican. He visited Central America eight times as vice president. I think he also visited the hemisphere an additional eight times as vice president, the Caribbean and other places. So, so he, they, you know, the problem that we have for the region is that we have so many other challenges in the world and because it's largely at peace and we're not kind of threatened by kind of like, there's not a, 
there's not as of yet a Chinese military base or as of yet a full on Russian military base. So we take it for granted the space, the, the safety that we have from the hemisphere. And so I think it causes us to often overlook, but there's also kind of a balance where the region doesn't want too much of our attention either. They, you know, they would like, they, there's always saying we'd like more attention. So I think what I would like to see is further movement on a trade agenda for the Western hemisphere. So uh, George H.W. Bush talked about a hemisphere trade agreement, uh, Bush, uh, Clinton, and then Bush 43 pushed on that. It died in 2005. Uh, we've tried to do piece mail, pieces of it through things like CAFTA and the Colombian Free Trade Agreement. Um, Uruguay and Ecuador are asking to do that now. The Biden administration is not answering the mail on that. We should be, Republicans in Congress ought to be taking this opportunity to, tr to do something on this. I also think after this, um, I spent a year in my basement and I suspect Carolina, you spent a year in your basement and Valerian spent a year in his basement because of COVID. I, I want a different kind of a relationship with mainland China. And so I think we are thinking about nearshoring and kind of whatever you want to call it, friend shoring, allied shoring, nearshoring, resilient supply chains. No one wants to depend on China. If they say I'm going to cut off your meds or cut off your pills, those are grounds for divorce. So if you said to me what that means is I think we need to think about a different kind of a nearshoring agenda for the Western hemisphere. It plays into other things. It can't just be lecturing our friends in the hemisphere about drugs and migration. So a lot of our, if our agenda is only drugs or migration, that's like a loser. So we need to have something on trade, something on nearshoring. So, so if you are worried about climate change, then you gotta be absolutely love mining. You got to love mining to the tips of your toes, Carolina. And we're, we're not fully pricing into the conversation on climate, the issue about mining. That decarbonization, if it's going to happen, and I'm not sure it will, but if it was, that it's going to require, not is not the same thing as dematerialization. We're going to need lithium. There's a thing called the lithium triangle in Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. We're going to need copper. That's also in the Western Hemisphere. We're going to have to have a whole minerals and minerals and metals processing agenda from Canada to Chile. We're not fully there yet. So we need something on min mining and minerals, something on trade, something on nearshoring, and something on digital. And then I would say something on education and training. One of the challenges is that many of these countries are stuck in what's called the middle income country trap. And so some of it's about most of the folks have gotten to the levels of, of literacy. But in terms of skilling and jobs and, and you have people being trained for the right for the jobs of the present and the future, that's not necessarily the case. So something on education would be another thing. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. We are actually at the end of our, our time. I so enjoyed the conversation. I enjoyed the book even more because there's a lot more there that one can get out of it. I, I recommend it to everyone here and whoever watches this video on YouTube. It's got history. It's got specific tools and instruments that we have used um, over the past decades to, to, to make kind of, you know, uh, significant and, and, and beneficial change for countries. It's, there are also some missteps as there uh, as well that we can learn from. So it's got everything and it's really a, a fun and enjoyable, uh, enjoyable read. So thank you for joining us then for writing this book. And I'll also recommend The Ugly American. There's my copy here that Dan talks about it in the book a few times. It's a novel. It's a great one. There's also a movie on it if you don't want to read uh, and you can watch uh, Marlon Brando in it. Uh, but you get the American Imperative book recommendation and the Ugly American from Dan. So I think you should be well set to, to, uh, to take on this mission that Dan outlines for the next generation. But thank you, Dan, again, for joining us, for writing the book and for talking to, to our students and, and our audience. And I'd love to come speak at more AHS chapters. We'd love to have you. So uh, get, get ready for more invitations. That's great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Valerian. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Uh, have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.